So, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks to Hervé for inviting me to speak about a slightly uh, different matter at this uh, workshop from what we've heard so far. I've learned a lot and I guess my uh, task is now to convince you that not only does my full slides fit on here, there's something cut off. That's too bad. Um, let me just quickly see if I can make this straight. Um, but basically that it might be important to look at, uh, I don't know, should work, no? Well, you just don't see all my sources because they're gonna going to be at the bottom. Um, I guess that's quite all right. Okay, um, oh, there it is. Um, so I'm going to try to convince you that it's important to look behind the scenes uh, of uh, financing uh, financing the investment that's supposed to scale up renewable energy and why that might matter. This is joint work with Mariana Matsukato from the UCL. Uh, I'm currently based at SOAS and uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. So a quick run through our model, uh, sorry, our paper. One of our papers is basically what I'm going to show you with a slightly extended motivation of why you know, this is even a problem, um, the whole investment side of things. So, uh, we have seen yesterday from Professor Bardi that, that basically the share of renewables in energy mix is very low. In fact, you can't really see what's going on there, so let's just zoom in. This is from 1965, you know, BP, commercial, renewable, uh, commercial energy supply, so traditional biomass isn't in here. That would add you another 10% up here, but since we don't want to scale up traditional biomass, let's just ignore that. Here's the share in the energy mix over time. And so if we look at the top 20% of that uh, energy mix, we see that we have hydro consistently around 5 to 6, 7%. Um, nuclear scaling up in the 80s, but then actually declining its share. And back here we have the new renewables uh, like solar and wind and uh, commercial biomass uh, making inroads into the energy mix couple of percent um, supplied in 2016 actually. Um, well, but what about the investment into this uh, energy mix? Uh, the energy sector uh, uh, is it's very capital intensive, so something has to maintain uh, all these power plants and these heat plants. And uh, this is uh, from the International Energy Agency. You can see the time series starts in 2000. So people started worrying about investment. Uh, you know, we have this data only from 2000. So this is sort of a new, a much newer thing. And to be honest with you, the investment data for fossil fuel power plants is really bad, actually. These are just very rough estimates. But for renewable energy, we know quite well how much has been invested. And you can see here the share of investment, of total investment in the energy sector. This is around 1.5 trillion 2016 uh, US dollars. Uh, so this is the amount of total investment and on the right hand side you see the share of that investment that goes to financing fossil fuel energy. And that's actually quite consistently at around 70% until 2014 and then we see a slight drop here. You may ask why is it so low? Well, you need to finance, of course, hydro and nuclear power, but you also need to uh, uh, finance the grid, which um, is shown here as electricity networks. Okay, so this is not in the fossil fuel grid, uh, in the fossil fuel share. So, in spite of all the talk about scaling up renewable energy, we still, of course, have a very large share of investment going to fossil fuels. And when we wrote the paper, we only had data up to 2013. So, you know, you don't actually see any change in the share of investment going to, renew, uh, to re fossil fuel. Um, when we look at only renewable energy investment, we see, again, a graph shown by Professor Bardi yesterday. Um, we see that it's been scaling up. We have good data since 2004 only, um, where we can distinguish a little bit what's actually going on with this investment. Well they go mostly to what is called asset finance. So these are big utility scale power plants, like a big solar uh, farm or a wind farm. Uh, so most of that is really coming from asset finance, f it goes to asset finance. And then you see uh, this uh, orange line here is rooftop solar investments, or at least the best estimate we have of how much that is. 
and that has been fairly large in uh, after the financial crisis nice generous subsidies in some countries uh, but then actually declined uh, in total and as a share and the rest is R&D and venture capital and actually I call this stock market here that's really uh, public so stock market money going into companies that make renewable energy you see that's actually very little compared to the rest so simply maintaining the energy system and scaling up renewables uh, costs a lot of money compared to you know maintaining the companies that make these things and what you also see is that basically since around 2011, in fact 2011 you shouldn't really look at because there's a lot of government stimulus after the uh, financial crisis, but roughly since then there's not much of a rising trend anymore, right? You can argue that yes, the last three years there was more, but um, it doesn't rise anymore like uh, in the earlier years. So who cares? Well. Everybody does, okay? Um, you can read any publication from any of these international bodies. You will read, you can read it four years ago, you can read it today. It's a funda fundamental reorientation of the energy supply investments is necessary. Necessary for what? Well, for avoiding catastrophic climate change, for reaching some Paris goal and all these things. Um, the EU has just uh, issued a high-level expert group uh, report on how to reorient the financial system in order to achieve this and again you see in the European Union you need around 170 billion euro every year in additional investments into uh, well energy and sorry not just renewable energy but most of that goes into renewable energy and yesterday one of our presenters said that we need to invest 10 times more okay into these things well here are a few projections of what we need. These are uh, a lot more conservative than Ugo Bardi's uh, uh, estimates, but um, in a nutshell, these are three, you know, big short projections. This is the IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency. This is the International Energy Agency, and this is Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, the biggest data collector in this sector, and everybody relies on their data, including us in our paper. So they have these. Uh, historical estimates of how much has been invested and the growth rate. This is negative because between 2011 and 2016, at the time they wrote this report, it actually looked like a negative trend, but it's very hard to estimate these and you make ex post corrections, so now it would be a positive sign. But whatever is this uh, uh, past growth rate here, you typically see that it has to uh, triple or at least double uh, from today onwards or from last year onwards, and it doesn't really do that. Okay, so I hope I could convince you that there is, uh, from the powers that be, and I guess this is shared in this workshop, although we know that there's a material problem, but if we really want to go to renewable energy, we also need to uh, find uh, the finance that's willing to do these investments. And while I haven't shown you that, um, there's actually an opinion that it's very hard to find this finance, okay, because renewable energy uh, projects today perhaps less so, but still in some sectors is a fairly risky undertaking and so your typical pension fund, if you come from the Anglo-American world, everybody puts their money in private pension funds, right? And these are supposed to invest somewhere and get a return and even though returns on renewable energy can be fairly high, they typically don't do so because they aren't even allowed uh, because of their covenants. They say this is too risky for us, okay? All right. So, the question that my co-author and I have tried to uh, answer is whether we can learn something about how to increase investment by taking a closer look at the nature of investors and investors investments. So I'm using financing and investment slightly uh, interchangeably, okay? But uh, I'm really thinking about the money, the people that have the money that can go towards financing these very large, very costly projects, okay? So, what do we do? Well, basically, this is what we're talking about, right? There's some money that goes to building these nice little power plants, or very large power plants, but what we don't know anything about is who is actually providing this money, okay? And there are quite different entities that provide money for these projects. In fact, the companies that make renewable power plants also invest in them and run them, okay? So they are owners of power plants like the wind turbine uh, manufacturer Vestas. We have utilities like EDF that of course own a lot of these um, 
power plants. We also have government agencies that put in, as you will see, quite a bit of money into uh, these kinds of investments. And then we have our financial sector, for instance, this big US pension funds. Okay, But we actually don't know what they're doing. At least this is not part of the discussion. So our idea is that, um, you know, perhaps depending on who you are, you do very different things. Um, so there are, I guess, two issues involved here. One is, do they even invest in renewable energy? Okay, I just gave you a reason why we shouldn't expect institutional investors to put too much money into this entire sector. Um, this is an interesting question, but uh, I, I won't uh, problematize this anymore here. But then uh, the other question is, do these uh, different organizations that invest, do they all do the same thing? Or do perhaps some of them only invest in some technologies and others uh, in others? And so is there anything we can learn about directing our investments flows, not putting all eggs in one basket or financing the more the less advanced, more risky technologies, which are particularly hard to finance. Who's doing that? Okay, who has done this in the past, and what can we learn from that? So, what we did is we actually um, dis uh, divided the sources of finance into uh, ten different types of investors. Six of these are privately owned ones. Okay, you have energy firms, uh, basically some non-financial. Uh, firms and some financial firms. There are also a few unclassified investors that we can't say much about. And uh, public uh, investors, so we have State Bank, I think the Agence Française de Développement counts as a State Bank, would count as a State Bank for us. Uh, the German KFW, the European Investment Bank, the China Development Bank, State Utilities, uh, whenever the state owns a very large sh share in a utility, it would be a state-owned utility like EDF. Uh, we have other state corporations that are not active in the financial energy sectors and we have government agencies such as the Department of Energy. We can also distinguish in our data uh, 11 different technologies in which uh, these uh, different investors invest. So really what I'm going to show you uh, are some you know, uh, estimations, some correlations, really just descriptive statistics here, uh, what's going on, who's doing what. Okay. Um, we are looking only at asset finance, basically because that's where we have good data for. So asset finance is high capital intensity, okay, renewable energy power plants are, require a lot of capital expenditure up front. So we're in this area here and we know that there are certain hard to fund high risk projects and others that are not so hard to fund, okay. And typically for these here, you get project finance or you have existing firms putting these on their balance sheets. But for those, this is very hard to do. And if we think we need to finance these, because if you do them, you do get learning by doing, you get experience with these technologies and eventually you can actually finance them. And while we're talking here about renewable energy, this principle that it's hard to fund innovative technologies, scaling them up, it's easy to fund them, not easy, but you know, you can always fund a laboratory or maybe a, uh, a pilot project, but it's hard to get the money for the big scaling up of the real projects. So this is, uh, I think, in general, a question of financing innovative technologies. So we can also think of electric vehicles here or uh, grids or some other technologies that are not as you know, far ahead as renewable energy at this point, or at least some technologies there. Well. What's really cool about our research is that we have access to the Bloomberg New Energy Finance data. And so we can actually look at individual uh, projects and the financing deals that pertain to them. So we can we have a database with around 40,000 uh, asset finance deal participations in around 30, sorry, 29,000 unique uh, power plants, okay, and which is an asset that is financed. Uh, these are utility scale, so they're larger than one megawatt uh, capacity. And we also use, sorry, and we know who is financing that and what kind of uh, technology it is. And we have data on the technology, sorry, the cost and location that we use to also create a measure of financing risk. 
it's subjective and you can argue with me about it, but basically we classify every uh, uh, investment into whether it's low, medium or high risk. The location is important because it depends on the country whether you have a, a good or a harder uh, investment environment. And so, you know, we don't have data on what is high risk and low risk, but we try to create such a measure here. You can read all the details in this paper here. All right, I don't have much time, but I'll show you a couple of results. The first result is just since we know who are the investors, we can actually find out, for instance, uh, what share of total asset finance comes from the private sector. This is this solid line here. And we can also know what uh, share of, uh, well, the remainder is really coming from the public sector. And one really intriguing result is that as time goes by, uh, public finance becomes more and more important. In fact, the scale up in asset finance, at least since around uh, 2009, which is financial crisis, with a subsequent real economy crisis, has been driven mainly by uh, public investments. And you can tell me, well, this is all due to China, and you're right. I mean, in fact, any increase in investments since around 2009 is mostly due to China, which is now the leader in almost all renewable energy technologies and also electric vehicles. And they're also investing most in smart grids. Um, but even when you subtract all the investments made in China, which are made mostly by Chinese state-owned corporations, hence this huge increase here, you still see that even in our capitalist uh, uh, market societies, um, the public share is uh, surprisingly high. If you study economic innovation and who should finance that, you have a theory that as you go down the stream of the innovation line, so coming from R&D through venture capital and, and prototype financing, maybe demonstration plans, to the deployment, the public sector should get out. Okay, This is where private capital should take over. So we don't see that. And that's just um, maybe not very interesting for you, uh, but uh, in general, this is a very powerful result here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. No, this is not stacked. Uh, sorry. Yeah. These are. So we still have a majority of private finance, but the fact that this is around forty percent or so, and we just got data back to ninety. 2017, but I can't show it to you yet because there's a lot of cleaning to, do to be done. Uh, it would be interesting to see how this evolves. So not stack graphs. Uh, another very simple summary measure is, uh, well, what's the riskiness, the share of high risk investments in, in, this, in the total asset finance? So I've just translated this low, medium, high risk into a, an interval, zero to one, okay, if your share of high risk investment is 100%, you get a risk exposure of one. If it's all low, you get a risk exposure of zero. So on the whole, we see there's uh, a fairly um, low risk uh, taking going on in, in the entire asset finance. But once again, once we take out China, we actually see that in this part of the world, public sector asset finance uh, takes on much higher risk, okay? It's subjective, but I would defend this risk measure. For instance, nobody would argue, I think, that in 2009 or 10, offshore wind financing is more risky than onshore wind financing. And so these kinds of uh, uh, qualitative differences in the riskiness have led us to classify investments. So uh, public sector investments are a lot more risk-taking, and that's also another interesting, but not very surprising, uh, result because that's kind of what you think that public sector money is more patient can take more risk because they don't go bankrupt but what we take away from this is that public investments are fairly important well i have a few more detailed um, results but i don't really have time to show them to you so you can take a look at this paper um, if you're interested um, basically we can do that for different um, financial actor types the results are fairly pretty much confirmed we also see that the high-risk technologies like offshore wind, concentrating solar power, uh, marine energy, okay, um, tidal and wave energy, and second-generation fuels, you typically see that just a couple of actor types are the ones that are really driving the investment there, and they are also uh, 
responsible for increases and decreases in overall finance. If you're interested here in France, Marine Energy, there was one investment by EDF, and that's really the highest ever investment that was made in uh, marine energy. And since then, we haven't seen much in marine energy. You can expect that we won't, we haven't proceeded very much with the development of, of this technology at the deployment level. All right, so I'm just going to skip over this table. Uh, this basically tells you that different asset, uh, different f actors have different assets in their portfolios and they are more or less distributed. Um, I wish I could tell you, well, this is exactly the contribution that this type of actor is making um, to the deployment of that technology. This is ongoing research where we're doing a little bit of inferential statistics using regressions. That's what economists really like to do all the time. Um, so hopefully soon, half a year onwards, we'll have these results. Uh, but for now, I, I just wanted to show you these uh, qualitative, sorry, not qualitative, but descriptive stats. And in terms of what this may imply is that different types of financial actors do have different financing patterns. Okay, we don't know yet what that means, but we haven't seen that before. So this is just uh, something that subsequent studies should take into account or may take into account when they f think about, for instance, policies. If you want to drive your wind uh, um, technologies, you know, are there specific actors that can help you with that? It's a pot possible question. And if you want to bring specific actors in, do you perhaps want to know what they are prone to financing? And the big debate in in financial circles is how to get these institutional investors to bring more money into renewable energy. But actually w what we see is if they bring in money, they only invest in very low risk deployment. So that's maybe something interesting to know. Maybe, you know, if you want to bring in the next swathe of more innovative technologies, perhaps this is just not the money that, that you will get for this. So you have to look elsewhere. Um, I think I have to stop. But uh, I just want to end on the fact that uh, I don't think it's a matter for the state to uh, finance these transitions today. Although in the past, for instance in France, going from oil to nuclear, it was completely government financed. It's not so easy to get these numbers. Iceland, Norway, the state did everything and those are very successful transitions from the point of view of changing your energy mix. I know there's a lot of resistance to uh, nuclear energy in France, so I'm not going into that side of it. But uh, we may basically ask ourselves which kind of finance is really getting us away from fossil fuels right now. And there's a lot more in uh, research to be done on that. Thank you very much. So we have time for short questions. Yes, one question. One point you didn't mention is the obligation of the consumer to subside uh, all the utilities through a part of his energy mm. bill, which is quite important in, in different countries like in France or Germany. Yeah. And this is part of the investment. And the other one is to do created with this, the financial crisis, at least in Europe, uh, produce a reduction usually of this subsidization subsidi mm. subsidi after the a financial crisis that may explain the stop yeah. or the uh, the rollover of the investment. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, the typical story is that you get more finance by, you know, increasing a feed-in tariff or uh, a purchasing power agreement with a favorable price. So that's where all the focus of research has lain so far. And I wouldn't deny for a moment that this is extremely important for getting money into this sector. You know, if you have basically a certain return on your solar panels on your roof, as some of you may have, uh, it's a no-brainer if you have the capital. And there are people who have this capital. But as, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the crisis uh, led to Spain basically uh, retroactively bringing these costs back to the people who built those PV panels on their head. So sorry, on the house. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, so there's an important uh, uh, role for policy in both directions, also policy past uh, the crisis. But um, typically, these subsidies are not so good at 
getting out the high risk technologies because you don't want to put a marine power plant in front of your community if you don't know how it works this is just me making an anecdote here but but so uh, our hypothesis is basically that these direct investments of certain actors which also have to be financed and we have large transfer transfers in our national economies today going on from those who get the subsidies uh, from those who have to pay them to those who make them but uh, we think that certain strategic investors are quite important for getting high-risk assets off the ground and I haven't spoken about state banks but when you look at their investments they are actually extremely important as well as certain state-owned utilities I'm just mentioning Dong or Ostet from Denmark for getting for instance offshore off the ground the, the, the point with renewable energy is the capital intensity of such and the very low operating cost which means that on a pure bear gaining point of view, the price can be as low as uh, operating cost, which is close to zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, as such, uh, it's very risky to invest if you have a high discounting rate, which is a ca the case of a private company. So I'm afraid that uh, uh, the, the true parameter of your table is uh, what is the discounting rate of actors. And if uh, it's public actors, the uh, discounting rate is, is, is low, so they can invest. Mm -hmm. Other, otherwise, uh, a private uh, uh, actor cannot uh, invest. So I am afraid that uh, in order to have something uh, valuable for uh, renewable energy, regulation has to be put into place mm -hmm. in order to regulate the price of the product at the end of the day, to avoid to have, uh, for example, very low price of electricity with uh, solar panel, for example, or even negative yeah. price, as you have seen already. So I'm afraid mm. that uh, perhaps regulation and perhaps also nationalization also. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I, I think historically we see that uh, governments have played much larger roles in the energy sector than today. Well, not always. But at least since uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and I think in France, the entire en energy uh, industry was nationalized after World War II. Um, you know, I could go into talking about uh, neoliberalism as in uh, this idea that it should be the private sector who is running the energy sector because that leads to more competitiveness and somehow more efficiency. But uh, one way of looking at the problem that we have today is that we have too few strategic players who aren't uh, too uh, constrained by having to deliver short-term gains and perhaps wanting to see returns after three years and not after 20. That's one way of going there. I'm afraid if you want to advocate this position, you have a very, very strong opposition ag ag up against you. So it's probably more uh, uh, important. Uh, more feasible to think about regulations that would, for instance, keep up prices. And I think a lot of regulation has done that, but it doesn't seem to be enough to really let the money pour in. Please, following the, the, the previous question, thank you for the talk. Do you see a scale of risk taking into account shares, bonds, and loans by bank? Because there are many kinds of financing. So if you are shareholders, you take much more risk than with bonds, and uh, and and the bank loans are also another kind of taking risk and financing. Do you see some differences there in your approach for the I different actors, shareholders or uh, or uh, bondholders or, or banks? Yeah. So the gearing ratio in so the difference between basically debt and equity financing is I, I understand what you're saying. So the gearing ratio in project finance is typically very high often 60 or 70 percent of the money needed and the money we talk about for individual projects can go into the billions of US dollars or euros for that matter. Um, I, I haven't really, I have data on equity and debt finance and we haven't really looked systematically at whether there's any difference there but there are a lot of problems with these data. For instance, debt financing is systematically underreported because often you do not get the data. So the data set assumes that it's just balance sheet financed. So a company goes and just pays the whole thing. And so it's basically equity 
uh, that is paying for this. So it's very hard to make inferences about that, but um, I guess the high gearing ratio basically tells you that uh, you know investors are unwilling to take on too much equity initially, and then you often see refinancing and acquisitions as the project is actually built, which really reduces the risk because you know it's there, it's running, and um, you don't have, you know, if all goes well, it just sits there and generates mm -hmm. cash. I have also a comment or question concerning the risk, how you define it. Yes. Because I had a discussion with Munich Real Estate a few okay. years ago, and they just argued in the, in the opposite way. They say with this fat in tariff, the risk of the money for renewable energy mm -hmm. has a state guarantee, and so it is really low risk. And then I argued with the risk of a turbine failing and so on. And that he said, okay, this is a risk for a single person who has one turbine. It's a big risk. But for us as a, as a company, a real estate company, insurance company, this is no risk at all. We know to handle it if you have hundreds of turbines. This risk is our business to take mm -hmm. it into account. And the big part is that we have these state guarantee <laughs> with the Fed in tariff. This is German. And then he even claimed one should make investment how many money from real estate companies and so on was transferred to Germany because you have high interest possibility and low, they said exactly, low risk. Hmm. So this is a little bit, but that's why I think you're thinking of another risk. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand. You're saying the feed and tariffs and guarantees would lower the risk of investment. Because it's a state guarantee. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, yeah, and okay. He, he told me yeah. It makes quality. No, I. Yeah. Oh, okay. S uh -huh. So I think this, we, we actually agree on this, and part of the risk measure, which I now cannot show you in my appendix slide here, um, is, is, is to take into account uh, a measure of a, gov uh, a country's uh, policies towards renewables. So a country like Germany would be. You know, all the projects in Germany are de-risked, and when you have a particularly feed-in tariff for solar, then this is particularly de-risked. So that's in there. So we're looking the residual risk after these uh, investments. But thanks. Yeah. So we can continue the discussion during the pause now for the coffee, and we start at the quarter to six exactly, sharp, because we have an appointment. Thank you.